Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I would like to welcome you all to the final session of this very productive virtual counterterrorism week. The interactive closing discussion will focus on member states' counterterrorism priorities in the post COVID 19 environment synergies and complementarities between COVID-19 and the counterterrorism agendas. I have the honor and pleasure to welcome our nine distinguished speakers and commentators who will be sharing their perspectives and insights on this important theme. Joining me on the panel for this closing session are the Honorable Mr. Nathan Sales, Ambassador at Large and Coordinator for Counterterrorism at the U.S. Department of State. His, Her Excellency Ms. Gabriela Cuevas Baron, President of the Interparliamentary Union. His Excellency Mr. Thomas Greminger, Secretary General of the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. His Excellency Mr. Smile Sharge, Commissioner for Peace and Security of the African Union. His Excellency Mr. Dang Ding Q, Permanent Representative of Vietnam to the United Nations and the Chair of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, New York Committee. Ms. Ellison August Treppel, Executive Secretary of the Inter-American Committee against terrorism of the Organization of American States. Mr. Gilles de Kerhoff, Counter-Terrorist Coordinator of the European Union. His Excellency Mr. Mohammed Fatih Ahmed Idris, Ambassador and Permanent Representative of Egypt to the United Nations. His Excellency Mr. Jiang Zun, Ambassador and Permanent Representative of China to the United Nations. Dear colleagues, few words about modalities of upcoming discussion. We will first hear from our speakers and commentators, followed by brief intervention by other participants who have been pre-registered with us to take the floor. While we have tried to accommodate all requests for live interventions, given the time constraints, we had to limit these interventions to delegations on a first-come, first-serve basis. Subject to the availability of time, we will also try to address the questions and comments that you may post during the session using the chat functionality of the live event. Without further ado, I would like to give the floor to our first speaker, the Honorable Mr. Nathan Sales, Ambassador at Large, and coordinator for counterterrorism within uh, the U.S. Department of State to deliver his remarks. As a tenured law professor, Mr. Sales previously served as Deputy Assistant Secretary for Policy at the Department of Homeland Security. He also worked on counterterrorism policy in the Justice Department's Office of Legal Policy. Sir, you have the floor. Well, thank you very much, Vladimir, and good day, everyone. Um, I'd like to thank UNOCT for hosting this conference, um, and thanks in advance to my fellow panelists for their comments today, as well as for their contributions in our shared struggle against terrorism. In my remarks today, I'd like to focus on several top U.S. counterterrorism priorities. In particular, I'd, I'd like to highlight three. First, continuing the fight against ISIS affiliates outside the core by dismantling its global network, second, countering Iran-backed terrorism, and third, boosting the capacity of partner states on the front lines, particularly in Africa and Southeast Asia. Let me start with ISIS. Now, after the territorial defeat of the so-called caliphate in Syria and Iraq, we're degrading ISIS's networks around the world. In Africa, ISIS-affiliated groups are active across the continent, including in the Sahel, the Lake Chad region, and East Africa. Groups like ISIS West Africa, ISIS Greater Sahara, ISIS Somalia, ISIS Sinai, and ISIS Mozambique have conducted attacks throughout Africa, including in Mali, 
Niger, and Burkina Faso, among uh, other countries. Sorry, I would like to ask colleagues to mute all the microphones. Sorry. Thank you very much. Uh, words of wisdom and words to live by in the COVID era. Press mute. Uh, in Asia, we saw ISIS-inspired terrorists conduct horrific bombings on Easter Sunday in 2019 in Sri Lanka, where 260 innocent people were killed. In the Philippines, the ISIS-affiliated Abu Sayyaf group killed 11 soldiers and wounded 13 others, the deadliest attack since the Holo Cathedral bombing. In response, the United States has led an international effort to designate and sanction ISIS-affiliated groups and key ISIS figures around the world, starting with our own domestic sanctions authorities. To date, the U.S. has designated 15 ISIS-affiliated groups worldwide, as well as over 140 key ISIS individuals. We've also pushed to, sh to sanction ISIS affiliates at the UN's 1267 committee, and we welcome the imposition of sanctions on six ISIS-related entities since May of 2019. That includes affiliates in Afghanistan, Yemen, Libya, Indonesia, as well as West Africa. And we look forward to continuing to work with your countries on this project in the future. In addition, the U.S. is bringing the resources and expertise of the Global Defeat ISIS Coalition to bear on this next stage of the fight. As Secretary of State Pompeo reiterated last month during a coalition small group ministerial, we remain committed to rescheduling a coalition event on ISIS threats in West Africa as soon as health conditions will allow. Finally, we've made significant investments in building the partner capacity uh, on the front lines of this fight against ISIS. I'll come back to that in a moment. Let me turn now to Iran. Last month, the State Department released our annual country reports on terrorism, finding in 2019 that Iran remained the world's worst state sponsor of terrorism. Over the last several years, Iran has continued to plot attacks around the globe, we saw a series of assassinations and attempted assassinations in the heart of Western Europe in 2017 and 2018. And Iran also continues to back numerous terrorist proxies around the world. In the last year, Iran supported terrorists in Iraq, including Khatib Hezbollah, have launched deadly attacks against US and coalition and Iraqi military facilities. Iran has supplied the Houthi rebels in Yemen with weapons used to attack airports, energy infrastructure, and other civilian facilities in the UAE and Saudi Arabia. And Iran continues to work hand in glove with Hezbollah, a truly global terrorist threat. In response, the US has used our sanctions authorities aggressively to cut off the flow of money to Tehran and its terrorist proxies. Last year, we designated Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, including its Quds Force, as a foreign terrorist organization. This was the first time the FTO label has ever been affixed to part of a foreign government. We've also taken decisive action against Hezbollah, which has been subject to US sanctions since the 1990s. Since 2017, the state and treasury departments have announced over 100 designations of Hezbollah leaders, financiers, and facilitators. We've encouraged, and we are encouraged to see, more and more countries taking a similar approach. In Europe, the UK and Germany have designated or banned Hezbollah in its entirety, rejecting the false distinction between its so-called military and political wings. So is Kosovo, and the Netherlands treats all of Hezbollah as a terrorist organization as well. Just last month, the Austrian parliament enacted legislation calling for tougher action against this group. It's a similar story here in the Western Hemisphere, where we've seen Hezbollah designations from Argentina, Canada, Guatemala, Honduras, and Paraguay. Let me close with a few words about the United States capacity building efforts. The United States has made substantial investments in the capabilities of our partners on the front lines. We want them to be able to defend themselves against ISIS, Al Qaeda, Hezbollah, and any other terrorist threats they face. We want them to be self-sufficient and independent actors that need not rely on others for continued assistance. The United States has been and will remain the security partner of choice. We've proven time and again that we are the indispensable counterterrorism partner and that we bring capabilities that no other country can match. In Africa, we've worked to build civilian counterterrorism capabilities, creating crisis response teams that are able to interdict terrorist attacks and collect evidence, improving border security and aviation security, 
and improving capacity uh, to investigate, prosecute, and incarcerate terrorists. In other parts of the world, like South and Southeast Asia, U.S. assistance has had a direct impact on our partners' efforts to hold terrorists accountable for their crimes and prevent them from getting on planes. The results are clear and they speak for themselves. We've seen U.S. trained law enforcement units disrupt major terrorist incidents around the world, including in Afghanistan, Kenya, Mali, Somalia, and Tunisia. We're also seeing partners successfully prosecute cases and put terrorists in prison in the Balkans, in Indonesia, and in the Philippines. We're proud of the success that our friends have achieved by working with us. And we're also proud of our track record of fighting terrorism while advancing human rights and the rule of law. Indeed, the two goals go hand in hand. Research has shown that human rights violations can fuel terrorism, conflict, and instability. According to the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights in 2018, compromising on human rights has proven corrosive to the rule of law and conducive to a climate of impunity and may undermine the effectiveness of any counterterrorism measure and thereby contribute to greater radicalization. In short, counterterrorism approaches that disregard human rights and the rule of law are ultimately self-defeating. Which brings us to Xinjiang. The United States has strongly objected to China's mass detention of Muslim Uyghurs and other minorities, repressive surveillance, and use of coercive population control like forced sterilization and abortion. I'm sure you saw our announcement yesterday that we've imposed sanctions on some of the officials responsible for these abuses. Today, I will only add that no government should use counterterrorism as a pretext for stifling religious freedoms and other fundamental liberties. Not only is it wrong, it doesn't work. In closing, the United States will continue to support our partners, as well as valuable fora like the UNOCT and our shared fight against terrorism in all its forms. Thank you very much. I would like to thank uh, Mr. Nathan Sales for sharing his important insights. Uh, thank you, Nathan, for your informative contribution to this uh, decision, uh, to this discussion on U.S. Uh, counterterrorist priorities. And now I would like to invite Her Excellency Ms. Gabriela Cuevas Baron, the President of the Interparliamentary Union, to deliver her remarks. Gabriel, you, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Under Secretary General Barankov. Thank you very much, very much, Excellencies, dear ministers, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to start by thanking the United Nations Office on Counterterrorism for organizing this important week long event focused into counterterrorism. I must say that I am concerned. The challenge posed by the COVID 19 pandemic will deepen and exacerbate already existing structural problems. The road to creating sustainable, thriving, and inclusive societies was already paved with considerable obstacles. Now we are at great risk of suffering a major setback. More and more people will be marginalized as a result of this pandemic, and this will result in them being more susceptible to radicalization. This is where I want to be very clear. We must understand that terrorism thrives when there is a lack of equal opportunities, when young people are robbed of their future, when the only option is to despair. There must indeed exist international cooperation to stem the tide of terrorism and avoid the loss of innocent lives, particularly at the most vulnerable. Women and children end up suffering enormously but we must also address terrorism and its root causes. Building towards peace also includes enable economic prosperity for all. And I am certain that if all parliamentarians, 46,000 parliamentarians all over the world, strive to create conditions for peace, the world be as less a harsh place for, for those who have already at an end tragically suffered enormously loss. Therefore, member states must stay ahead of this trend. They have to anticipate it by taking action now. The COVID-19 has ravaged economies, economies around the world. Many will be in, in dire need of help. Therefore, states must ensure that social safety, safety nets can be kept in place and that people can have access to proper healthcare. 
in these hard times, people need to be reassured that they are not alone. In doing so, we will avoid any future deepening of the existing structural problems. On the other hand, states must contain the pandemic to stop it from decimating any more lives. However, as noted in the IPU's parliament in the time of pandemic campaign, responses must also be rooted in a firm legal basis, set out on national law, respectful of equality, temporary, free of discrimination, and very importantly, to be necessary and proportionate to the protection of human health. This is a true for COVID-19, as it is for the counter-terrorist responses. Threats are not to be dismissed, but they must be also assessed rationally. Institutionalizing undemocratic practices through fear is a step too far and would be counterproductive. It would divide rather than unify in a time when that is precisely what is more needed. The way forward to countering the deep stated causes of terrorism is not through alienation, it's through inclusion. And if we want to strengthen support for international counter-terrorist cooperation, that is the principle that we must consider, inclusion. Countries which concentrate the vast majority of victims of terrorist attacks are those whose voices and opinions are less heard and considered. As such, no response to this problem can attest to be comprehensive when it leaves out the perspective of those who may purpose to help. International cooperation is essential as it allows the global community to offer a, concert, a concerted response to terrorist attacks. But it is more when it can only affect uh, only a few dictate terms while making key decisions. I have to point out that the IPU has been for years giving prioritizing cooperation with the international community on the global efforts to counter terrorism. Yes, we are working with the UN Office on Counter Terrorism and with several partners. The IPU assemblies have adopted numerous resolutions which highlight the need for parliaments to cooperate with the United Nations on the implementation of its counter-terrorist resolutions and strategies. In this important regard, I think that IPU offers a privileged platform. We are the natural bridge between international commitments and the national legislation. The natural bridge between international and global cooperation and local solutions. In 2018, the IPU strengthened its political support for the international counter-terrorism activities through the decision of the IPU Governing Council to create a high-level advisory group on counter-terrorism and prevent violent extremism. In the IPU, we understand that parliaments are key to addressing terrorism. Yes, we need to translate international commitments to global cooperation, national realities, local solutions. We need laws for inclusion. We need laws to stop arms, weapons, and bullets flow. We need laws for international cooperation. We need laws for prevention. Laws fully respectful of human rights. Laws capable of stopping terrorism groups. And of course, we also need to work into our budgets and, and oversight responsibilities. We must go for global standardization to local focus in order to be tailored support for the safety of everyone involved. We have a huge responsibility with youth. We need a huge responsibility. We have a huge responsibility with women, with girls, with those people that are being the most affected of terrorism attacks. You can count of the, on the parliamentary community. We are here to help. We are here to improve legislation and of course to work together because we need to harmonize all our legislation in order to work together. In the end, all we I can hope for a safe, inclusive and prosperous future for the people that we represent. We owe them not only to the present generation, but also to the girls and boys that are expecting a lot from us. Thank you very much for inviting us. Thank you, Gabriela, for your statement. I, I think it's really very important to develop this inter 
parliamentary cooperation because we need to have a harmonized international understanding how to deal with the scourge of terrorism. And of course, contributions from the parliamentary communion is very important in this regard. If you don't mind, I will say some words about you. Ms. Cuevas is the youngest person and the second woman to be elected president of IPU. She has been actively involved in several UN initiatives and has a long career as a Mexican parliamentarian, as a federal member of parliament, a local member of parliament, and member of Mexico City's Constituent Assembly as a senator of the Republic. Thank you again for your very informative statement. And now I would like to invite His Excellency Mr. Thomas Greminger, the Secretary General of the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, to deliver his remarks. Prior to his appointment as OEC Secretary General, Mr. Greminger was the Deputy Director General of the Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation, the permanent representative of Switzerland to the OEC and the United Nations and head of the Federal Department of Foreign Affairs Human Security Division. Sir, you have the floor. Thomas, we can't hear you. We can't hear you. Please unmute your microphone. You are still muted. It's okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Excellent. Okay, so uh, thank you very much, uh, Vladimir. Um, excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, uh, first I would like to thank you, Vladimir, uh, and your team at Yono City for organizing the 2020 Counterterrorism Week in these very challenging times. Indeed, COVID-19 has become a transnational security threat. The Organization for Security and Cooperation, OEC, has responded in a proactive way and, and with commitment and with creativity. The pandemic has exacerbated existing challenges, but is also an opportunity for us to think about new ways for implementing our mandates in cooperation with other partners. As highlighted by other speakers in the course of this week, we have identified a number of short and long-term impacts of COVID-19 on OEC's work. Let me just mention four. First, terrorist organizations and violent extremism, extremist movements, including violent Islamist groups and violent far-right organizations are trying to capitalize on the vulnerability on the fear and the uncertainty generated by the pandemic. To advance their causes, they are spreading disinformation, hatred, propaganda online, which is even more damaging in times of lockdown. Second, there is concern that terrorists may develop new operational capacities, taking advantage of the changing security environment and increasing risks to soft targets in critical infrastructure, including health institutions. Third, a lack of access to vital services such as healthcare can contribute to the grievances that make individuals vulnerable through recruitment into violent extremist groups. So it is important to consider the potential negative long-term impacts of the pandemic and the ways in which they may create conditions con conducive to violent extremism and radicalization leading to terrorism. And fourth, technical innovations as applied in border management and security, as for instance, API, PNR, biometrics, artificial intelligence, might be seen as promising tool for containing COVID-19. But it is important that such tools are applied with robust safeguards for privacy and protections against discriminatory effects. And we are happy that 
UNOCT and OEC have a joint program to assist member states in this area. At the OEC, we are committed to supporting our participating states and partners for cooperation to deal with these multifaceted challenges. We will continue to promote a measured and proportionate response to evolving terrorist threats during this period of global vulnerability. In doing so, we will take into account the heightened relevance of the rule of law, gender equality, and human rights in shaping counterterrorism strategies and laws. We will also continue to support national institutions in developing whole of society approaches to preventing radicalization to violence. Dear colleagues, at a time of emergency, governments first tend to focus their resources on responding to the challenge within their borders. This is a natural tendency in times of crisis. However, transnational security threats such as COVID-19 pandemic demand that we also look outward. And this is where the UN, the OEC, and other international partners come in. At the OEC, we have used this time to strengthen our programmatic work on the handling of electronic evidence, on counting terrorist financing, and on gender mainstreaming in law enforcement, just to name a few of our focus areas. And as I said before, technical innovations as applied, for instance, in border management, might be seen as promising a tool for containing COVID-19, but it is important that such tools are applied with robust safeguards for privacy and protection against discriminatory effects. To this end, we have organized numerous virtual discussions, workshops, and expert roundtables, drawing together different OEC executive structures and reaching out to national experts and our international partners, including the UN, the EU, and Interpol. Among several new initiatives, the OEC recently launched an e-learning course on preventing and countering the use of the internet for terrorist purposes, available both in English and Russian. Together with UNODC, we also recently conducted the first online training for Central Asia on countering the financing of terrorism. Ladies and gentlemen, the OEC is the largest regional organization under Chapter 8 of the UN Charter. Most of our staff is working in locations where the reach of the international community is relatively limited. We have people on the ground ready to provide support wherever possible and in line with respective mandates. The UNOCT OEC biannual action plan of September last year has further strengthened our cooperation. OEC and UNOCT cooperated on two conferences on countering terrorist financing, one in Ashgabat, one in Dushanbe, and co-organized another in Ulaanbaatar. In February this year, the OEC and UNOCT jointly with the Swiss government convened a regional high-level conference on foreign terrorist fighters in cooperation with the Albanian OEC Chair 2020. At this joint event in Vienna, there was a strong focus on repatriation and rehabilitation, particularly of women and children associated with foreign terrorist fighters, in line with the key principles put forward by UN Secretary General Guterres in April, April last year. The draft outcome document of this conference will inform discussions at the upcom upcoming OEC Annual Counterterrorism Conference, convened by the Albanian OEC Chair in September. It will take place in a hybrid format, as has become common practice at the OEC. In parallel, we are also working on an update of our joint action plan with the ODC. Moreover, we have joined forces with the UN Counterterrorism Committee Executive Directorate in the area of soft target and critical infrastructure protection and supporting country assessment visits with our experts. And we continue to compare our working agendas with those of UN Women and UNDP. We are firmly committed to providing a substantive contribution to the fight against terrorism in strong partnership with the UN 
and other international and regional partner organizations. I thank you for your attention. Thomas, thank you very much for your important contribution to today's discussion. Especially, I think it's very important that you raise this issue of women and children detained in the camps on the territory of Iraq and Syria. We need to move forward in trying to find the solution of this very issue together. And I am very grateful to you, to uh, your efforts and the efforts of your staff that we have so excellent cooperation between my office and OEC. So I think it's a very good prerequisite for proceeding forward more effectively in implementing our common counterterrorism agenda. So I thank you very much for your valuable contribution. And now I have the pleasure to give the floor to His Excellency Mr. Shmel Shergi, Commissioner for Peace and Security of the African Union. Serving as a commissioner since 2013, Mr. Shergi was Algeria's ambassador to Russia and Ethiopia, as well as permanent representative of Algeria to the African Union. With more than two decades of work on African affairs, he has also served in Morocco and Switzerland and in various capacities in, at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Excellency, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Excellency and the Secretary General for Counterterrorism and dear Vladimir. Distinguished colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, allow me to begin by thanking the UNOCT for inviting me to be part of this important discussion. Indeed, as we have heard from previous speaker, the COVID-19 pandemic have not only captured the attention of, of the whole world and our citizen, but has also become an important topic for terrorist groups, including Al-Qaeda and the so-called Islamic State. Both groups have publicly commented on the various, offered their own take on the situation and have even proffered advice on how to mitigate its effect through issuing a set of Sharia directives to deal with epidemics. Advising their members to hand wash and keep away from infected area, which to some extent mirrors the social distancing and quarantine measures spelled out and advocated by the centers of disease control and prevention. It is also important to know that both groups, ISIS and Al-Qaeda, have issued statements urging supporters to exploit the situation for recruit recruitment, planning and stepping attacks and exploit the COVID-19 pandemic as an opportunity to advance their agenda, consolidate their position, entrench their roots into communities, extend their tentacles, and attract new members to expand their support bases and strengthen their ranks. Chair, groups such as Boko Haram, uh, Jinim, ESGS, ISWAP, Al Shabaab have undeniably stepped up attacks in their zones of operations, while terrorists affiliated to the so called ES also claimed new territory in Mozambique. ADF also continues its deadly attacks against civilians and defense and security forces in East DRC. Indeed, as the world's attention tur turns almost completely to the COVID 19 pandemic, the battle against terrorism in Africa has taken one of the deadliest turn yet. From January to April 2020, the continent recorded a total of 508 terrorist attacks, resulting in 2,938 deaths in comparison with the same period in 1929, uh, 19, 2019. We, we had nine. Uh, 497 terrorist attacks and 2,584 deaths were recorded, representing a 2.21% increase in the numbers of attacks 
and 13.7 increase in deaths. This demonstrates that terrorists did not lose any of their operational capabilities. Even more, this shows that their degree of lethality has increased. Since the beginning of the year, the Sahel Belt of Western Africa has recorded the highest number of terrorist attacks and casualties compared to the rest of the continent. There were 16 attacks leading to 100 84 deaths in Southern Africa, especially in Mozambique, and the 10 attacks that resulted in 30 deaths in North Africa. The five most affected countries in the first four months of 2020 were Mali, DRC, Nigeria, Somalia, and Niger. Excellencies, terrorists have employed increasingly sophisticated tactics in recent months as they have driven deeper into Mali, Niger, Burkina Faso, whereby they attacked army bases and dominated villages with surprising forces. They are destroying infrastructure, assassinating local leaders and assaulting key army posts in coordinated strikes to alienate government from the people. They exploit border areas to meet the forced hit out to plan ambushes and attacks, share intelligence and exchange battle tips, including how to make roadside bombs, particularly near the three state border of Mali, Niger, and Burkina Faso. To support in degrees, it is networked that despite the support from the international community, GNIM, ESGS, and other extremist groups appear to be gaining ground by exploiting long-standing grievances in the region, inter alia governance deficit, perceived neglected, vast area of territory, and existing inter-ethnic tensions, often emanating from scar scarcity of resources. While the spread of terrorism and violent extremism on the continent is worrisome, it is even more alarming to see terror groups exploiting the outbreak of COVID-19 to spread their propaganda messages, as well as utilizing diverse social media platforms to spread extremism ideologies and boost recruitment. They are occupying as much space as they are occupying both the physical and the virtual or space or cyberspace. Indeed, terrorist groups can size the situation to their advantage in specifically the battle of winning the hearts and minds of population, where governments are already struggling to, in providing basic services to communities, extremists could step to, do, to fill the humanitarian vacuum created by COVID-19 outbreak by increasing service provision, medical, water, and food, acting as de facto authority and building on that popular support to their cause and proto-states. Chair, while the short, medium, and long-term effect of COVID-19 are difficult to determine, it is clear that it will impact the global city response and allocated resources. As the pandemic continues, it can also for other opportunity to terrorists and violent extremist groups, some of which are highlighted below. Radicalization. The terror groups such as ISIS and Al-Qaeda have historically capitalized on natural disasters as supposed proof that God is supporting them in targeting their enemies, impressing upon followers that if a natural disaster causes this much suffering, terrorist actions can bring about similar destructions using man-made methods. While we witness a rise of xenophobia acts with some link to COVID-19 pandemic, we also need to ponder the possibilities of the emergence of ultranational extremist terrorist groups on the continent. Financing. While kidnapping for ransom and drug trafficking continue to finance terrorist organizations, illegal exploitation and trade 
of natural resources are emerging as major sources of terrorism financing in Africa. The COVID-19 pandemic can, can lead to an increase in COVID-19 related crimes, including fraud, cybercrime, misdirection or exploitation of government funds or international financial assistance. These new sources of proceeds for illegal actor, uh, actors there being exploited by terrorist and transnational crime organizations. Three, weaponizing the virus. There are increased worries that terrorists could try to weaponize their own virus by trying to infect other people. They might use children and women as potential carrier, as well as internationally displaced persons and refugees camped as contamination centers or hubs. Four, terrorism and transnational organized crime nexus. As countries around the globe continue to maintain their borders closed due to the COVID-19 pandemic, to increasing restricting the movement of goods and people, transnational organized crime and terrorist groups will likely increase their exploitation of the security vacuums created by the shift in attention. Excellencies, despite these challenges, our collective fight against terrorism and violent extremism has been resolute. Our member states have not remained idle, especially those at the receiving end of terrorist attacks. This is demonstrated by the continued offensive operation undertaken across the continent, such as the most recent offensive against Boko Haram by the Chadian forces as part of MNGTF and AMISOM offensive in Janale, Operation Komoe jointly undertaken by troops from Cote d'Ivoire and Burkina Faso, and Operation Lafia Doli, in which Nigeria troops are battling terrorists in the northern part of the country. We can only encourage the member states to continue with the help of the international community, their relentless fight against terrorist groups and criminal networks including drug traffickers, to eliminate and deny them the opportunity to further take advantage of the difficult situation posed by inter alia the COVID-19 pandemic. It is our conviction that the fight against terrorism will continue and abate it as we encourage our defense and security forces to adhere to necessary precautions measures. We, stay, we salute the continuous and activate implementation by the Commission of the 7992 Assembly decision to support the fight against terrorism in the Sahel through the upcoming deployment of 3,000 troops, which will certainly make its positive impact felt across the region. While the COVID-19 pandemic poses a multitude of challenges to the peace and security landscape, it also provides us with an opportunity to harness our effort toward working decisively to end violent conflict on the continent and address the root causes. We need to think outside the box and allow ourselves the space to engage in innovative ways to silence the guns in Africa, even those guns carried by terrorists and violent extremists. One, we need to engage terrorists and violent extremists in dialogue and encourage them to surrender, in particular, those that have been forced rolled into the ranks of these groups. At the same time, we need to demonstrate as much resoluteness to eradicate the root causes conducive to the spread of terrorism and violent extremism as the resolute demonstrated to combat the threat altogether. Two, we need more innovation and partnerships to help prevent the spread of terrorism and violent extremism at national regional and continental levels using available resources. Three, we need to move beyond predominantly military action to include soft approaches. Four, with the multitude of security arrangements and forces operating within regions, in particular the Sahel, we need to set up proper and stronger coordination between the different forces operating in the field and clarity with regards to command and control. Excellencies, as the burden of COVID-19 pandemic spreads further into the Africa, 
the potential for terrorist groups to continue to exploit existing vulnerability to gain support and strengthen will likely increase. It is vital that neither the concerned member states in the different regions, uh, their neighboring countries, the regs, nor the international community turns their focus away from con countering the threat that, uh, that such groups pose. Continued cooperation and more comprehensive approach that addresses the underlying drivers of radicalization towards terrorism and violent extremism are necessary to stop the further spread of terrorism activities in Africa. Our collective action and cooperation is needed now more than ever to silence the guns on our continent. I thank you for your, your attention. Well, thank you very much for this very informative, very frank and very uh, detailed presentation of the situation in African continent. Of course, we do understand that this situation is not a very easy one, but we are ready to give more support to uh, the African member states in our counter-terrorism activities. So I also very grateful to you for excellent cooperation with the African Union uh, between my office and African Union colleagues. And I hope that we will implement our idea to visit together Mozambique when COVID-19 will allow us to do so. So again, thank you very much for your contribution to the discussion. And now I would like to invite His Excellency, Mr. Dan Ding Gyu, the permanent representative of Vietnam to uh, the United Nations, who also serves as the chair of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, to provide his remarks. As a career diplomat, Mr. Q previously served as vice minister for foreign affairs, and before that, as rector of Diplomatic Academy of Vietnam and the director general of the Institute of Foreign Policy and strategic studies of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Sir, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Mr. Under Secretary General Vladimir Voronkov. Ladies and gentlemen, at the time of pandemics, people are spending more time online than ever before. Being exposed to the disinformation and terrorist ideologies and propaganda. The multitude, the multitudes of uh, misinformation, increased expressions of discrimination and xenophobia, as well as the socio-economic consequences. If unresolved, can contribute to its condition that conducive to terrorism and violent extremism. Understand of interaction between the pandemic and the threats of global terrorism will provide insights into how to better combat terrorism in the post-pandemic environment and prepare ourselves for the future threats. I take this opportunity to commend the Office of Counterterrorism, UNOCT, for organizing this very timely event. I echo several panelists that at all times we must remain vigilant to the search of terrorism and we must prevent and fight terrorism together. Like the pandemic, international terrorism respect no border and no country is safe until all is safe. An essential part of our joy response is a strong multilateralism with the United Nations at the center. So further coordination and coherence among United Nations entity and other stakeholders must be ensured. We must see new and emerging forms of terrorism, including cyber attacks, bioterrorism, and terrorist use of the internet for propaganda, inciting violent extremism, spreading fake news, showing hatred and divisions. It should be noted that any measure to prevent and to combat terrorism must fully comply with the relevant obligation under international laws. In particular, the United Nations Charter, including its purpose and principles, as well as obligation under human rights law 
and international humanitarian law. Member states bear the main responsibility to protect their people in recovering from the crisis and building back. We must not reduce our commitment and resources to counterterrorism. International cooperation and capacity building is ever more critical to effectively detect, identify, investigate, and prosecute terrorists and serious criminals. Sharing of information and intelligence on terrorist travel, exchange of ex experience and technical assistance in border management, and countering terrorist financing should be maintained and adapted to the new reality. We must enhance the capacity of state to use information and communication technologies in countering terrorist use of digital technologies. Programs and activities by several United Nations entities, including UNOCT, UNODC, and Interpol, to assist member states in building capacity along this path should be furthered. Regional and sub-regional organizations have an important role to play in promoting intra- and inter-regional cooperation. In order to fulfill this role, they must be provided with necessary support by the member state and the United Nations system. Counterterrorism, radicalization, and violent extremism, including new form of terrorism, has always been a high priority for the Association of Southeast Asian Nation ASEAN. The ASEAN plan of action to prevent and counter the rise of radicalization and violent extremism 2018 and 2025 has been effectively implemented, complementing international efforts under the United Nations framework. Finally, the, the strong focus must always be on prevention. The key to prevent and to counter the threat of terrorism lies in addressing the root causes of terrorism, including unemployment, injustice, inequality, discrimination, marginalization, and unresolved conflict. But we must remain firmly committed to resolving conflict, eradicating poverty, promoting sustained economic growth and development, and ensuring respect for human rights for all. We must ensure the whole of society approach. We would like to acknowledge the role and potential of women in preventing and countering terrorism. We will not lose sight on the vulnerability of the young people in the digital environment. They should be involved in the promotion of a culture of peace and tolerance through education, job generation, and empowerment. Mr. Under Secretary General, let me complete by reiterating the firm position of our government to reject and condemn terrorism in all its form and magnification. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you for your contribution to the discussion. I think you mentioned two very important issues. Uh, first of all, of course, prevention is a key for our counter-terrorism activities, because if we are preventing better, we could avoid uh, this mitigation of the results of terrorism activities. So it's very important point you raised. Secondly, regional framework for cooperation. I think it's also very important uh, to have strong national efforts, but also in wider arrangements like local, uh, like regional arrangements and I think our cooperation with uh, the Association of South East Asian Nations is our cooperation with the Association of South East Asian Nations is very important for development of common counter-terrorism agenda. Uh, again thank you very much for your contribution and now I would like to give the floor to Ms. Ellison August Treppel, the Executive Secretary of the Inter-American Committee Against Terrorism of the Organization of American States. Uh, with over 25 years of experience working within the Inter-American system, focusing on multi-dimensional security issues, Ms. Treppel has previously served 
as section chief and later deputy director of the OAS Department of Public Security. She has also served as political liaison to numerous OAS security related bodies. Madam, the floor is yours. Under Secretary General Varonko, distinguished authorities, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Organization of American States, let me begin by extending our congratulations to the United Nations on the commemoration of its 75th anniversary. We reiterate our full support for the UN's longstanding efforts to maintain international peace and security in accordance with the principles set forth in its charter, and particularly during these extremely challenging times. As UN Secretary General Gutierrez indicated at the opening of this event, terrorism, like the virus, does not respect national borders. It affects all nations and can only be defeated collectively. So we must harness the power of multilateralism to find practical solutions. The Inter-American Committee Against Terrorism, or CICTE, is the Western Hemisphere's principal multilateral forum for preventing and countering terrorism. And we are committed to responding to our member states' evolving and multidimensional security concerns from a strategic and practical approach, both during and after this pandemic. The COVID-19 outbreak is having a particularly devastating impact in this hemisphere. Over 5 million COVID cases have been registered and more than a quarter of a million people have died since the pandemic began. Or our region's economies are expected to contract this year by more than 7%, with the Caribbean economy potentially seeing a decline of 20 to 30%. And on top of this, in cities across the globe, we're seeing significant public unrest in the name of social injustice. Any of these issues alone would pose significant challenges to maintaining peace and security. But together, they create the conditions ripe for terrorist exploitation. So we believe that there are four key areas that our region and perhaps other regions must focus on in the coming months. First, effective biosafety and biosecurity measures are key. The disproportionate death toll in the Americas from the 2009 H1N1 outbreak and the current, current COVID-19 pandemic underscores the urgent need for greater awareness, engagement, and investment in biosecurity and bio. Over the next three years, DICTE will be working with both policymakers and scientists to improve biosafety and biosecurity protocols and strategies throughout Latin America. Second, COVID poses new challenges for cybersecurity. Increases in telework and online learning have generated a 50% increase in global data traffic, to which some sources are attributing a 350% increase in phishing attacks. To better support our governments, businesses and citizens, we need to redouble our efforts to prevent and mitigate the impact of cyber incidents and attacks on our critical infrastructure. We also need to prevent terrorists from exploiting information and communication technologies during the pandemic and develop greater capacity to counter online radicalization and violent extremist propaganda. So developing effective national cybersecurity strategies increasing national capacities through cyber incident response teams, establishing cybersecurity confidence building measures, and fostering greater public-private sector collaboration will be crucial for preparing our region against future cyber threats. Thirdly, in anticipation of our eventual return to public life, we must begin to implement measures that ensure the safety and security of our crowded spaces whether they be tourist destinations, sporting, or other major public events, we need to develop and or modernize protocols and practices that will help build confidence in the security of mass gatherings. And fourth, real-time exchange of operational information among counterterrorism authorities is ever more critical. 
Through the Inter-American Network Against Terrorism, a new network that is being created specifically for this purpose, SICTE will continue to help facilitate cooperation and coordination among its member states to counter terrorist threats. Because as a region, we are committed to working together towards this goal. In fact, on June 3rd, the OAS commemorated the first Inter-American Day Against Terrorism. On this day, our member states not only reflected on the devastating impacts that terrorism has had in our region and on the thousands of lives lost, but also on the many important efforts being carried out to ensure that we are better prepared to prevent and respond to future terrorist attacks. Through these reflections, we know that we need to promote greater awareness of the risks of terrorism and violent extremism in our region particularly with all of the societal changes the, the pandemic is expected to bring about. We know too that we must continue to move away from being a reactive society and focus greater attention on preventive efforts, namely by strengthening capacities to protect our region's critical infrastructure, by increasing the exchange of operational information with our neighbors and partners, and by fostering greater preparedness and resiliency among our communities. But we also know that our challenges are not unique and that other regions, as expressed today, are facing very similar tests and trials. And this is why our participation here today and our valuable partnership with the United Nations, its specialized agencies, and other regional organizations is so important. Because ultimately, we believe that cooperation and collaboration among all stakeholders continues to be the most practical and strategic response to countering terrorism across the globe during and after the pandemic. And so regardless of the challenges that may come our way, the Organization of American States and its Inter-American Committee Against Terrorism stands ready to support global and other regional efforts to prevent and counter terrorism and to working together with all of you to achieve our collective goal of international peace and security. Thank you very much. Now, I would like to thank Ms. Ellison Treppel for these very important insights. And now I have the pleasure to give the floor to Mr. Gilles de Kerhoff, the counter-terrorist coordinator of the European Union. Prior to his appointment in 2007, Mr. Kerhoff served as Director for Justice and Home Affairs at the European Union Council General Secretariat, simultaneously serving as Deputy Secretary of the Convention, which drafted the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union. Before that, he was head of the private office of the Deputy Prime Minister of the Federal Government of Belgium, successfully, successively Minister of Justice, Minister of Economic Affairs, and Minister of Defense. He also teaches in several universities. So you have the floor, Mike Let me start with a warm thank uh, to you, Vladimir, and to your team uh, for arranging this, I must say, very interesting uh, first, but I hope last virtual city week. Uh, dear colleagues, having uh, listened very carefully to your interesting interventions, I'm delighted to hear that we all agree that first, neither COVID-19 nor terrorism are problems that we can solve alone, and second, that our response must be based on effective multilateral cooperation centered around the UN. Both COVID-19 and terrorism require indeed a comprehensive approach informed by expert insight from a range of disciplines in which the UN, international organizations like the OSCE, like the OIS, like the EU, government, civil society and the private sector work together. We are currently facing a health crisis which is unprecedented in uh, our lifetime. This extraordinary crisis requires exceptional measures. Yet, we should uh, always make sure that all measures are proportional and respect human rights and fundamental freedom and that government can be held to account
for their action. This applies to CT and to the fight against the pandemic alike. Any other approach would be not only morally unacceptable, but as Nathan Sale said rightly, short-sighted and counterproductive, undermining public trust in our motives and in our ability to truly protect our citizens. While uh, ter the terrorist threat remains high in many parts of the world, the global pandemic has to date not give rise to a major increase in the number of terrorist attacks. As most of you have said, this may not end the world. Uh, Daesh and Al-Qaeda are exploiting, as we've heard, throughout the week, the health crisis on a large scale in their propaganda, blaming their perceived enemies for the spread of the virus. Uh, the pandemic uh, could fuel inequalities and social isolation that was uh, in, uh, also uh, stated many times, undermining individuals and societies' resilience against terrorist narratives and uh, recruitment drives. So we must uh, prevent the current health and economic crisis from becoming a security crisis as well. To this end, we should keep investing in CT and CVE and PVE program, that is obvious, and seek synergy with other priorities action uh, in the framework of the post-corona crisis reconstruction effort. The impact of the pandemic on fragile states, on refugees, on IDPs could be very, very serious. In a spirit of uh, transnational solidarity and multilateralism, the EU has long assisted vulnerable partners overseas in their fight against terrorism, uh, just to name uh, the Sahel or the Horn of Africa, where we are very uh, engaged. We are now assisting partners' country also to combat the pandemic. The linkages between both objectives are clear. A mass outbreak of COVID-19 could undermine cohesion in society and the ability of state to protect their citizens and to provide the base, basic services, as we, our colleague from the African Union said, helping terrorists to operate and expand. We should ensure that our city efforts do not impede the provision of humanitarian assistance, and the EU will develop uh, guidelines and good practices for this purpose. A possible resurgence of Daesh in Syria and in, in Syria and Iraq is a cause of concern. The under, underlying condition that led to the very quick rise of uh, Daesh in Iraq in 2011, between 2011 and 2014, uh, still need to be addressed. Uh, the EU provides humanitarian assistance uh, in the overcrowded uh, camps. Uh, in northern East Syria and through the ICRC to the uh, detention facilities, where the provision of healthcare is already highly precarious. An outbreak of COVID-19 could lead to violent uprising and fuel terrorist propaganda. Moreover, it's highly regrettable that this week the Security Council failed to review the authorization of cross-border humanitarian uh, deliveries into the Idlib area, where the uh, deterioration of the humanitarian uh, situation could lead to terrorist travel beyond Syria's borders. Violent right-wing extremist hate speech and uh, incitement to violence on the internet have increased dramatically since the start of the coronavirus. This is a bit something which uh, was uh, uh, um, stated throughout the week. Conspiracy theory disseminated by uh, right-wing violent extremism, falsely blame minority group for the spread of uh, the virus. To counter uh, the increasing international threat of terrorism uh, motivated by right-wing violent extremism, uh, the EU has recently agreed a series of actions. These include reinforced cooperation with our partner um, across the globe. The COVID-19 crisis has led by a disturbing threat uh, in terrorism. What I would describe as a sort of nexus between three types of speeches, terrorist speeches, hate speeches, and disinformation. Uh, terrorists depend on hate speech to radicalize and recruit followers. They thrive in a climate of uh, suspicion and distrust. Those who deliberately disseminate conspiracy theory create divisions and notions like us uh, versus them in our society, thus strengthening the breeding ground for terrorists. 
We need to devise creative ways to curtail the spread of hate speech and conspiracy theory on uh, the internet, uh, which we have started doing, uh, and uh, while fully respecting uh, free speech. This could include more flagging of this information, and I think we're considering the role of algorithms in, amplifi in amplifying extremist and fake content at the expense of moderate and mainstream point of view. The pandemic demonstrates to what extent we have now become, and that was just said, dependent on ICT and new technologies. We are all eagerly awaiting the arrival of a vaccine developed in high-tech labs. In Europe, there is a, a quite lively and I would say healthy debate on the use of apps for the tracking and the tracing of the COVID-19 infections in order to stem the spread of the virus. What I would call the digitalization of security will likely accelerate as a result of the current crisis. That was said just a moment ago. New tech can bring enormous benefits, but they also entail risk, uh, real risk for our security. Our dependence on ICT equipment at a time of confinement underscore our vulnerability to cyber attack perpetrated by terrorists or just ordinary criminals. Terrorists might increasingly use all this disruptive tech that we know, artificial intelligence, nanotechnology, synthetic bio, 3D printing, blockchain, UAV, and virtual and augmented reality, uh, you name it, and we should be uh, more prepared. At the same time, we should equip our law enforcement agency with the means to use this new tech to fight terrorism while respecting uh, fundamental rights and uh, freedoms and the rule of law. Finally, that was uh, said as well, terrorists have long been interested in the use of bioweapons. The COVID-19 pandemic has uh, shown how much our society is vulnerable to infections, which might give uh, uh, terrorists further inspiration to weaponize toxins or pathogens. There have been uh, some reports uh, of violent extremists encouraging supporters to deliberately spread the virus. While poison letter can be used with relatively uh, rel relative ease to attack individual targets, it's not that easy for terrorists so far to effectively deploy a pathogen as a large-scale bioweapon. Still, we must prepare for such a contingency which uh, would have a massive impact on our society. The EU uh, support partners preparedness and chemical for chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear disaster throughout the EU a CBRN Center of Excellence initiative, which is the European Union's largest civilian external security program all over the world. Let me end by expressing the hope that this terrible crisis will bring something good as well, a renewed impetus for cooperation. That is the only way to defeat the virus, and it's the only way to win the fight against terror. Uh, we look forward to, review of, uh, to the review of the UN Global uh, City Strategy and to exchange uh, of experience and insight live, uh, physically, at the global meeting of head of city agency in 2021. Thanks a lot. Gilles, thank you very much for your very analytical presentation of the uh, terrorism landscape uh, uh, globally. It's very important to have the knowledge about all the elements of the picture in order to be prepared to address new threats which could appear as a result of COVID-19 pandemic. And bio uh, weapon, bio use of biometrical, bi biological materials of, by terrorists is uh, a real threat and we need to be prepared to this threat. Of course, it's uh, not a fast story, but it could happen every day. It could happen every day. Fully agree with you. And again, thank you very much for your very uh, valuable contribution to this discussion. And uh, fully agree with you that, of course, uh, next year, let's have a hope to have this physical meeting in New York and to have successful uh, next conference in physical dimension, not only in a virtual dimension. Of course, it's, it's a part of diplomacy. It's difficult to live without this. So uh, 
Now I have the honor to give the floor to our two distinguished commentators who will share their perspectives and insights on the theme and on the issues that have been raised during this session. I am pleased to give the floor to our first commentator, His Excellency Mr. Mohammed Fatih Ahmad Idris, Ambassador and Permanent Representative of Egypt to the United Nations, and I would like to emphasize a very strong supporter of the Office of Counterterrorism. Ambassador, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, uh, dear friend Vladimir, uh, Your Excellency Vladimir Vorenkov, Under Secretary General for Counterterrorism. Distinguished speakers, my uh, dear co commentator, Ambassador Kanjo, this last segment of this uh, 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 Counter Tourism Week, uh, dear colleagues, uh, ladies, and gentlemen. Allow me at the, outset, at the outset to congratulate you, Vladimir, and the entire UNOCT team for successfully putting together this virtual counter-terrorism week. And we share your wish that we move from virtuality to reality sometime very soon. Indeed, it comes at a crucial point of time where we had to come together to reflect on the strategic and the practical challenges of countering terrorism in a global pandemic environment. While we are still looking forward for the second counter-terrorism week, which has been postponed to next year in tandem with the seventh biannual GCTS review, we believe that this virtual reduced format has been very successful in alerting us to most of the pertinent aspects related to countering terrorism in today's truly exceptional circumstances. Over the past few days, we have held very fruitful discussions, touching upon aspects of multilateral cooperation, responding to the threat of bio and cyber terrorism, the spike in hate speech and extremism in a pandemic environment, the plight of victims, global programs in dealing with FTF travel, rehabilitation and reintegration, human rights aspects, investi investing in the youth to build resilient societies, in addition to the role of civil society and media in this regard. We also toured the UNCCT virtual expo and were shown how the center is quickly adapting to the COVID-19 new normal while undertaking its vital capacity building task. This all has been extremely useful. I am sure it will provide very important guidance to the seventh GCTS review next year, as well as to the actual CT week. In response to the key issues, at discussion in this closing session, I would like to make the following three brief remarks. First, aside from the well-known needs of member states in counter-terrorism, as per the CCTS and its four pillars, the COVID-19 pandemic has outlined specific new needs which have to be addressed. Bio and cyber terrorism come at the forefront, as well as countering renewed terrorist narratives and hate speech, including racially and ethnically motivated terrorism. International cooperation and the commitment for multilateralism is more pertinent than ever. Also, UNCT's leading role mm. in coordinating for the global compact counterterrorism is also pivotal, together with the role of UNCCT as the global center for excellence for building state capacity and responding to the mutating threat of terrorism. Second, concerning the synergies and complementarities between response and recovery from COVID-19 and the counter-terrorism agenda, we find them to be very intertwined. The onset of the COVID-19 pandemic has clearly highlighted the need to update and develop the counter-terrorism agenda to respond 
to the emerging COVID-19 challenges, proving once again the essentiality of engaging into an extensive, substantive discussion during the upcoming seventh biannual GCT review. As you know, I was privileged to be tasked, along with my dear friend, Ambassador Augustine Santos, the PR of Spain, to co-facilitate the seventh GCTS review before it was postponed to next year. In the course of our preparatory work, we were more than often reminded that member states might have reached a state of saturation or fatigue when it comes to further developing the strategy, finding comfort in holding onto previously agreed language to maintain the fragile consensus achieved on the strategy during the past years. COVID-19, as a challenging and heartbreaking as it has been for the world, provides a genuine opportunity for us to engage into a real substantive discussion in the upcoming GCTS review to develop and update the strategy in a meaningful manner, which and with the aim of making the world a safer place. Nothing more than a consensual General Assembly resolution bringing together all member states can create the much needed international political impetus for international counter-terrorism operation. Finally, I would like to see this opportunity to emphasize that it is time more than ever for all member states to do their part in the fight against terrorism. All stakeholders must focus now on strengthening international cooperation and multilateralism for the good of humanity and to alleviate human suffering. The pandemic environment should not be further complicated by the continuation of precarious practices such as transfer of FTFs across international borders from one conflict zone to another. Such a practice must desist and all member states must act responsibly. Also in Egypt, our experience shows that once local terrorist organizations are enduring defeat and about to collapse, they try to revive by claiming allegiances to international organization groups, seeking an extra lease of life. This should not be allowed. We should not be trapped or dragged into this trap, and we should do exactly the opposite. Egypt has done and will continue to do its part in the states in supporting all global efforts in countering the scourge of terrorism and act as a supporting and reliable partner for all interested international and regional parties. In this regard, we are currently working with UNOCT on preparing for a high-level international conference to be held in Cairo under the title Towards a Comprehensive Approach to Combat Terrorism and Extremist Narratives conducive to terrorism, which we hope would further contribute to our common effort and endeavor and our common goal in enhancing our collective efforts to fight the scourge of terrorism. Thank you very much. Mohammed, thank you very much for your statement. If you don't mind, I will say some words about you. Uh, a resident doctor and career diplomat, Mr. Idris previously served as Assistant Foreign Minister for African Affairs, and before that as Egypt, Egypt's ambassador to Ethiopia and permanent representative to the African Union and the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa. He held several senior positions in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and served in the United States, Syria, and Turkey. And I'm very grateful uh, uh, that you remind us that uh, the next uh, regional conference on counterterrorism will take place in 
Egypt when COVID-19 allows, I think it will be very important discussion because it will be the first post-COVID conference of uh, uh, the Office of Counterterrorism organized together with the Egyptian government. And I appreciate your role as facilitator of this process on review of the global counterterrorism strategy. I hope that we will continue this work together in the next year. So thank you again for your contribution. And now I would like to give the floor to His Excellency, Mr. Jiang Zun, Ambassador and Permanent Representative of China to the United Nations. As a career diplomat, Mr. Jun previously served as Assistant Minister of Foreign Affairs and before that the Director General of International Economic Affairs, China's Ambassador to the Netherlands and Permanent Representative to the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons and Deputy Director of International Organizations and Conferences among other capacities in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Jung, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, Under Secretary General Aaron Kohls. Uh, I hope you can uh, see me. I cannot see you from the screen, I can uh, but I can you hear you very clearly. I can hear you very well. All right, that's, that's good. Uh, Under Secretary General, dear colleagues, let me start by thanking Under Secretary General Warren Kohls, uh, UOTC, organizing this virtual counterterrorism week, which is really a timely and important event. In the past five days, participants have conducted enlightening and fruitful discussions. I do believe uh, uh, this uh, uh, dialogue is very much uh, uh, interesting and helpful in broadening our uh, uh, understanding and deepening our understanding of the current situation and our uh, challenges ahead of us. With regard to today's discussion, I would like to share a few uh, comments. First, it is of importance to further promote multilateralism in counterterrorism efforts during and after the COVID-19 pandemic. Facts have proved that no country can stand alone in the face of pandemic situations, which also shows the growing threat from non-traditional security issues. We must redouble our efforts and enhance our responses. We have heard a lot about this, and I think we have a general understanding on this uh, uh, the serious situation. Terrorism knows no borders, and terrorism in all its forms and manifestations constitutes threat to international peace and security. Double standards should be avoided in fighting against the terrorism. By the strengthen, instead of weakening our firm support for international mechanisms and continue to support the UN to play the leading role in counterterrorism. Adhering to multilateralism and strengthening international cooperation is the only option for responding to the challenges. Strengthening counterterrorism efforts must be a priority when we are celebrating the 75th anniversary of the founding of the UN. Second, facing the new and evolving challenges of terrorism, we must be equipped with new tools, technologies, and take more prompt actions in fighting terrorism. Terrorism will not stop due to the pandemic. On the contrary, it may even utilize and exploit the opportunity and the gaps caused by COVID-19 to incite and advocate terrorist activity, to use cyberspace to spread extremism ideologies and poisoning our youth. While the link between the COVID-19 and terrorist activities needs further studies and analysis we should keep high alert on the impact of the pandemic. The spread of the virus also reminds us that the low cost and disastrous impact of bioterrorism, you have mentioned that point. 
We should further strengthen the legal framework and actions internationally, regionally, and domestically in all fronts of counterterrorism. Utilization of information technology, intelligence sharing, and the judicial cooperation should be fully enhanced. Relevant international instruments, including relevant Security Council resolutions, should be strictly implemented. We welcome the recent adoption of Security Council Resolution 2562 concerning COVID-19, which will really help strengthen the framework of counterterrorism. Actions are needed to implement these resolutions. Third. We need to enhance unity and solidarity in fighting terrorism and strengthen capacity building. We have also heard from the panelists about the importance of that. COVID-19 shows the urgent need for us to be united. Facing these challenges, no one is safe until everyone is safe. We need to build partnerships among all of us. The social and the economic conditions of some developing countries are very fragile and have been greatly exacerbated by the pandemic, creating soil for the breeding and the spread of terrorism. UNOTC has implemented a large number of capacity building projects with outstanding results. We hope that UNOTC will continue to strengthen its capacity building projects in response to cyber terrorism, bioterrorism, law enforcement, cooperation, etc. Counterterrorism in Africa should also be a priority. The Security Council is paying more attention to Africa nowadays, and we think we will continue to do that. Cooperation with regional organizations, including the AU, ASEAN, SCO, EU, is extremely important. Promoting development and regional cooperation are highly encouraged in response to the needs of member states to eradicate the root causes of terrorism. Finally, I want to make clear that China will continue to strengthen its political and financial support to UNOCT and the international counterterrorism cooperation. So, through the China UN Peace and Development Fund, we have sponsored a couple of UNOTC's projects in Africa and in major sporting events. In the future, we will continue to vigorously support the work of the relevant UN counterterrorism agencies and to participate in the process of the review of the UN global counterterrorism strategy. We are committed to jointly advancing our common struggle against terrorism and the pandemic to safeguard our common future for all. Mr. Secretary General, before I conclude, I wish to point out that we, China, reject the acquisition of the representative of the United States against China. Terrorism is our common enemy. There is no such a difference between so-called good or bad terrorists. Xinjiang Autonomous Region of China suffers deeply from terrorism and violent extremism. The whole world has witnessed about that. To address this threat, India has taken a series of preventive counterterrorism and de-radicalization measures, which is in line with the UN Global Counterterrorism Strategy and the Plan of Action to Prevent Violent Extremism. These measures are widely supported by the international community and have yielded good results. Xinjiang has not seen a single terrorist uh, uh, incident in the past uh, three years or so. China is firmly opposed to the practice of politicization and the double standard in counterterrorism. We urge the United States to stop such actions and stop interfering in China's internal affairs. I thank you, Mr. General and the colleagues. Thank you, Ambassador Zhang Jun, for your remarks, for your presentation. You mentioned 
a number, you mentioned a number of very important keywords for counterterrorist cooperation. Partnerships, multilateralism, united action, international cooperation. I think it's key words if we would like to be successful in our fight against terrorism, terrorism and violent extremism conducive to terror, terrorism. So thank you again for very strong support for the Office of Counterterrorism. Thank you. We will now proceed with the questions and comments segment of this session, during which other participants will make live interventions following the speakers list we have established based on expressions of interest and established protocol. Mindful of time, I kindly ask all speakers to please limit uh, their intervention to two to three minutes. And now I would like to give the floor to the first speaker in my list. It's uh, Ambassador Vladimir Tarabrian, Director, Department of New Challenges and Threats, Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Russian Federation. Ambassador, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, our delegation had an opportunity to present in detail Russian approaches to key issues of counterterrorism against the uh, background of uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, that was on July the 7th uh, during webinar two. So today I will be very brief. Uh, I would like uh, to extend once again our most sincere con uh, appreciation to you, Mr. Undersecretary General, and to your team for organizing this indeed very useful virtual counterterrorism week, which enriched us all with valuable ideas and innovative approaches. The UNICT initiative to convene the global online forum on counterterrorism against the backdrop of the challenging conditions of coronavirus pandemic was extremely important. Despite all other difficulties brought by the current disturbing year, we can't but stay focused on our common security goals to ensure continuity of international cooperation in this area, which is undoubtedly of primary importance. Regrettably, not all interventions met the high standards of the UN discussion throughout the week. In particular, I would like to refer to the statement of the Ukrainian representative during webinar one. It would be beneath my dignity to argue with him, given his inability to make a minimum substantive contribution to the discussion. He replayed here absurd and false accusations against my country that we categorically reject as baseless and irrelevant. Perhaps it would be better for the Ukrainian representative to explain to the international community why the right wing uh, and now Nazi groupings so openly operate in, in Ukraine and why they enjoy the support and protection of the authorities. It's worth mentioning that, the, uh, that Ukraine was one of the two countries that voted against the United Nations General Assembly resolution combating glorification of Nazism, neo-Nazism, and other practices that contributed to fueling contemporary forms of racism, racial discrimination, xenophobia, and relevant intolerance. This document was initiated by the Russian Federation and gained wi wide support of the international community. Maybe this position of Ukraine can be explained by the fact that war criminals who closely collaborated with Hitler and actively participated in Holocaust in the, in the extermination of Jews and other national minorities are now proclaimed national heroes in this country. Uh, to conclude, I would like to reiterate the principal position of Russia, that the global counterterrorism partnership must be result-oriented and with no doubt free of political influences that is definitely not for the benefit of our efforts to win the fight against international terrorism. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador, for your intervention. 
Thank you. Спасибо, Владимир. The next speaker on my list is Miss Jennifer Lawton, Director General, International Crime and Terrorism Bureau, Global Affairs Canada. Miss Jennifer Lawton, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Mr. Undersecretary. Excellencies, colleagues, and ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to thank the Office of Counterterrorism for organizing a very successful virtual counterterrorism week. All of us who have been working remotely during this difficult time understand how challenging this is. And I'd like in particular to thank the IT section at the UN, in particular George and Joe, and their patience with all of us in making sure that we all appear on your screens and that we are all able to communicate with each other as we have been able to do normally in person and we look forward to doing again. The international community's efforts to combat the global threat of terrorism have made real progress in recent years. Unfortunately, increased internet use during the pandemic has also provided terrorists with new opportunities to manipulate the fear and confusion that the pandemic has generated, to recruit, to raise money, and to propagate their hateful messages. In the post-COVID-19 environment, we need to become as creative as our adversaries in our efforts to block the spread of violent extremism. To achieve long-term sustainable results, coordinated, holistic, preventative, human rights-based and gender-informed counterterrorism strategies have to remain central to our efforts. We also need to understand how our counterterrorism policies, programs and operations are experienced, especially by the most vulnerable. And we need to avoid actions that will have negative and unintended consequences on individuals and on diverse communities. Only by acting together with conviction and in compliance with international law can the international community respond effectively to the global terrorist threat in the long run. Canada's counterterrorism priorities in a post-COVID-19 environment will continue to be founded on six fundamental principles. One, building resilience by addressing the root causes leading to violent extremism and terrorism. Second, vigorously prosecuting all acts of terrorism. Third, regularly reviewing Canada's robust counterterrorism legal framework. Fourth, supporting multilateral efforts and building cooperative and partnership in partnerships with international partners, civil society, and non-governmental organizations, particularly those led by women. Fifth, deploying proportionate and measured responses to prevent and counter violent extremism and terrorism while safeguarding human rights. And sixth, taking flexible and forward-looking approaches to new and emerging threats. In 2021, Canada will host an in-country visit from the UN Security Council's Counter-Terrorist Executive Directorate. We're very much looking forward to highlighting Canada's domestic efforts to, and discussing further international cooperation to advance our common goals, as we have discussed today over the course of the week. In closing, Mr. Undersecretary, despite its significant and many achievements, I would respectfully suggest that the UN counterterrorism strategy has yet to achieve its full potential. It will be very important to ask what more we can do collectively to accomplish the strategy's goals. Let us commit ourselves to a constructive and cooperative discussion of this question during next year's seventh review of the Global Counterterrorism Strategy. I look forward to seeing you all at that time, and I thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Lawton. Thank you. I fully agree with your appeal that we need to work more closely because I think it's a prerequisite to the final success. The more understanding of each other, the more uh, productive discussions, the better for the final agenda of our action. Agree with you and thank you for this intervention. The next speaker on my list is His Excellency Mr. Majid Taht Ravanchi, Ambassador and Permanent Representative of the Islamic Republic of Iran to the United Nations. You have the floor, Ambassador. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Undersecretary General. Thank you, Vladimir, for convening this important meeting. Uh, in the fight against terrorists, there is no choice but to harness the power of the multilateral approach through enhanced information sharing and cooperation to effectively and swiftly address the vulnerabilities, mitigate the existing challenges, and find 
practical solutions for emerging problems. Despite the vital importance of collective and coordinated responses to terrorism and its devastating impacts, certain challenges still exist, emanating mostly from unilateral approaches. For instance, the unilateral coercive measures deny essential tools for a collective response to terrorism and hinder international cooperation as well as genuine efforts in this endeavor, hence providing a breeding ground for terrorism. The pandemic has even exacerbated the consequences of such a vicious approach. The imposition by the U.S. of its laws and regulations with an extra extraterritorial impact on my country and others is by definition tantamount to terrorism. The coercive measures are manifestations of structural violence that violate inalienable human rights, including the right to life. The United States' maximum pressure policy against Iran is designed to deliberately and indiscriminately target innocent civilians with the sole purpose of causing pain and suffering among them. Therefore, these actions constitute terrorist acts and in the broader context, economic terrorism. The United States' brutal and cowardly assassination of Major General Qasem Soleimani, the champion of fighting terrorists in the region, while on an official visit to neighboring Iraq, is another obvious example of a state terrorism pursued in gross violation of the fundamental principles of international law entailing criminal responsibility of its perpetrators. This tragedy was a big gift to Daesh and other terrorist groups in the region who celebrated his assassination. In other parts of our region, people continue to suffer from terrorism. The br brutal suppression of Palestinian people by the Israeli regime is among the gravest forms of terrorism, which should be condemned by the international community, especially in the time of emergencies. On the other hand, we must not lose sight of the fact that foreign interventions and, and aggressions in our region, especially in Iraq and Syria, have helped create the current violent extremist and terrorist groups. Last but not least, the excessive and disproportionate use of military force, including drones, in the name of countering terrorists, has created fertile grounds for vicious cycles of violence and terrorism, leading to disastrous results. The recent decision of the International Criminal Court to authorize the opening of an investigation of the crimes committed in Afghanistan has opened the windows of hope for the administration of justice. Mr. Chairman, the U.S. representative in his presentation today leveled unsubstantiated claims against Iran. It is common knowledge that Iran has been at the forefront of combating terrorist groups such as Al-Qaeda and ISIS. In fact, it is the U.S. who is promoting terrorism not only in our region, but almost everywhere in the world. The United States interventionist approach in our region has created chaos and an, envi an environment fertile for terrorists, terrorism to grow. Moreover, the U.S. has been harboring the MKO, a notorious and dangerous terrorist organization responsible for the killing of at least 12,000 Iranians and many Iraqis. Through providing the deadliest weaponry to the aggressors in the conflict in Yemen, the U.S. is responsible for the continued catastrophe in that country, resulting in terrorizing and killing of many innocent Yemenis. I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Manjit, thank you very much for your intervention. The next speaker on my list is Ms. Despo Michael, Head of Counterterrorism Department, Foreign and Commonwealth Office, United Kingdom. You have the floor, Ms. Michael. Thank you very much. And as we uh, come to a close and uh, we look at the synergies between uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and counterterrorism, I think there's three um, particular CT challenges that it's worth um, sort of bringing to the fore. Um, the first is the threat of more complex uh, attacks from groups that will have used the destruction of the COVID pandemic to plan and rebuild. The second challenge is increased extremism and radicalization in those who have been confined with others who have been of an extremist mindset or whose primary pastime during lockdown has been the darker side of the internet and those fueled by anger at lockdown constraints on their freedoms and the poverty unemployment that has been a consequence. And finally, possible gaps in our own CT defences while some states have had to remain in the deeper stages of the pandemic and CT resources may be deployed to other tasks. So these challenges will continue 
to require a global response led by the UN, supported by the various CT, multi-state nations, member states, NGOs, civil society. And it is only by working together quickly, sharing knowledge and experiences, offering training and providing support to each other, can we hope to meet this challenge head on and avoid a spike in attacks. The UK is very proud to be one of the few countries to meet the UN's Overseas Development Assistance Goal of spending 0.7% of GNI on support to the world's poorest and committed to maintaining the spend into the future and encourages others to do so. And it may seem strange to call for more development spending in the middle of a pandemic and economic crisis, but compared to the cost of a successful terrorist attack and the fallout, comparatively small sums of money invested in a targeted way can address some of the conditions conducive uh, to terrorism. So whilst we all meet the need for speed in our response, we must not lose sight of the fundamental and universal system of human rights, freedom of religious beliefs, diversity and gender issues, which, which my esteemed colleagues have referred to in their own interventions um, this afternoon. In the battle for minds, the moral high ground really matters. Human rights violations can play into terrorist narratives of victimization and their recruitment efforts. So we know this both from research and from what happens in reality. So as part of the UK's own commitment to human rights, we're proud to have been a founding supporter of UNITAD, and we've just launched the MURAD Code, a global initiative for assisting the survivors of conflict-related sexual violence and building an evidence base of their experiences in a more ethical, compassionate and effective way. So, um, Deputy uh, Secretary General, on Monday when I spoke, I talked about our top three future CT priorities so that we could hit terrorists where it hurts most by reducing the pipeline of those willing to commit terrorist acts and focusing on prevention, by cutting the flow of money and resources that sustains terrorism, and by denying terrorism the oxygen of publicity that enables recruitment and propaganda. So at the end of a fascinating week, let me thank you, Deputy Secretary Under General, and your team at UNOCT for an excellent week. And um, as I end, can I encourage us all to continue to mutually work together and support each other um, and to adequately, adequately resource our efforts as we face these challenges together. Thank you very much. Madam Michael, thank you very much for your contribution to the discussion. Fully agree with you that this is a new experience for all of us to use electronic media for organizing, electronic means for organizing these big events of international nature. Of course, it's a new experience, but we are learning from each other. And I think today's meeting is the confirmation that it could be used, it could be officially used. And uh, I think it will be a part of our, uh, our instruments for future as well. So thank you very much. The next speaker on my list is Mr. Hermogenes Esperon, Secretary and National Security <coughs> Advisor, Republic of the Philippines. Hermogenes, you have the floor. Good afternoon. I am happy to see you again uh, under Secretary General Boronkov, even if only virtually this time. I deeply value your visit to Manila last March, which helped concretize measures to strengthen our capabilities to address terrorism. As we discussed then, the Philippines counterterrorism priorities where UN can be most uh, useful include foreign terrorist fighters, border management and countering terrorist travel, and terrorist financing. These uh, priorities have not changed because of COVID-19. As President Rodrigo Roa Duterte stressed during the ASEAN summit last month, the pandemic has not killed terrorism. It remains alive lurking in the shadows. And so we must therefore be always on the alert. Terrorist groups, notably the Abu Sayyaf, 
continue to conduct many attacks. Online recruitment has increased. What has changed for us because of COVID-19 is increased focus on the threat of bioterrorism and countering the terrorist narrative, especially on social media. The Marawi Shids which stood out for the participation of uh, foreign terrorist fighters, taught us that an effective legal framework is crucial. I am therefore pleased to report that we now have a new Anti-Terrorism Act, which updates the 2007 Human Security Act, guided by the recommendations of UNOCT and CT. ED. Its enactment is fulfillment of our commitments under the UN Global Strategy on, on Counterterrorism and relevant Security Council resolutions, including Resolution Number 1624. The law now allows us to prosecute FTFs by criminalizing recruitment to and membership in a terrorist organization, becoming an FTF, and providing material support to terrorists and FTFs. The pandemic has broken down the illusion that public health and security systems are separate and independent of each other. As our national security strategy is anchored on the protection and safety of the Filipino people, any threat, including to public health, is necessarily a national security issue. That is why even if our resources, financial and human, have been stretched by the COVID-19 pandemic, we continue to increase our vigilance against uh, terrorism. Terrorism knows no borders, so international cooperation is essential. We will continue to work with bilateral partners as well as with ASEAN and the UN. For only through joint efforts can we effectively address the scourge of uh, terrorism. I thank you for your support of the Anti-Terrorism Act and for providing us with needed capacity building programs to strengthen our response to terrorism. Thank you, Mr. Undersecretary. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Mr. Sperong, thank you for your intervention. Uh, the next speaker on my list is Mr. John Brandolina, Director, Division of Treaty Affairs, United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime. Sorry, John, I made a mistake. Uh, now uh, the microphone is go to His Excellency, Mr. Sofian Mamouni, Ambassador and Permanent Representative of Algeria to the United Nations. Sorry, John, again, you will be the next. Ambassador, you have the floor. Thank you, Vladimir, uh, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. At the outset, uh, I would like to thank you, uh, Mr. Andres, the Secretary General, Mr. Vladimir Voronkov, uh, and the UNOCT for to terrorism, such as cyber attacks, bioterrorism, hate speech in light of the COVID-19 pandemic. Indeed, this pandemic is drastically affecting all aspects of life, which is far-reaching socioeconomic consequences and potential impact on the global terrorist landscape. It should serve as a stark warning that terrorism continue to pose a serious global threat to international peace and security, thus calling for more vigilance and intensified global and regional counter-terrorism efforts and solidarity. More than ever, as we are celebrating the 55th, 75th anniversary of the United Nations, we need to work collectively with a renewed commitment to multilateralism to ensure a better response to global terrorism and violent extremism conducive to terrorism in the context of this global pandemic environment. 
Algeria strongly believes that preventing and combating terrorism require further mobilization and multi-pronged strategies. Clearly, this fight cannot be limited exclusively to counter-terrorism measures. This underlines the importance of preventive measures. It also underscores the importance of the Secretary General's call for a global ceasefire to fight the pandemic and prevent violence exacerbating the condu condition conducive to the spread of terrorism and violent extremism conducive to terrorism. We therefore consider that it remains critical to address the root causes conducive to terrorism, including inequality and exclusion, continued economic deprivation, radicalization and violent extremism to ensure building peaceful, resilient and stable societies and countering terrorist ideologies. There is also a need to adopt comprehensive and inclusive approaches to countering terrorism and preventing violent extremism. We would like also to emphasize the importance of a balanced implementation of the four pillars of the global counterterrorism strategy. In this regard, the seventh review of the strategy will provide an opportunity to address and reflect the emerging challenges in the context of the COVID-19. While assessing such challenges, we should not lose focus on the need to mute your microphones. It's difficult to have this conversation when there is additional noise in the channels. <clears throat> While assessing such challenges, we should not focus on the need to put more efforts on the current challenges including the issue of foreign terrorist fighters. There remains also important to, to build new partnerships at global, regional, and national levels. Regional and sub-regional organizations, such as the African Union, have a key role in this connection. AFRIPOL and the African Center for the Study and Research on Terrorism, both based in Algiers, play the leading role in building the capacity of Africa in counter-terrorism and organized transnational crime. Having suffered from the scourge of terrorism, Algeria is at the forefront of the fight against terrorism and maintains a high level of vigilance and commitment in this fight and in the radicalization. The is based on the implementation of policies, strategies, and development programs geared towards addressing the factors of exclusion marginalization and just social injustice often exploited by terrorist propaganda for mobilization and recruitment purposes. Securing, securing our borderline and pursuing the fight against terrorism are also part of our overall counter-terrorism strategy. At the regional level, Algeria has developed a strong bilateral cooperation with its neighboring countries in key area to the fighting terrorism, mainly through sharing its experience thus contributing actively to the stability and security of the countries of the region. In the Sahel region, Algeria continues to deeply to deploy every effort to enhance full coordination and cooperation. The current context requires both coordinating and strengthening the capacity of the countries of the region on the basis of national ownership. Algeria is engaged in a concerted approach through several mechanisms of cooperation such as the countries of the field, the Joint Operational General Staff Committee, SEMOC, the Fusion and Liaison Unit, UFL for the Sahel, and other fora which contribute extensively in enhancing security cooperation between the Sahel countries through coordinating and strengthening border control measures, as well as training equipment and intelligence sharing. Let me conclude by reiterating Algeria's commitment to continue to contribute to the global and regional counterterrorism efforts and its readiness to share ex experience in the fight against terrorism and deradicalization. I thank you. Safiani, dear Ambassador, thank you very much for your comprehensive contribution to this discussion. I fully agree with you that cooperation with the African Union on counterterrorism is of crucial importance. So, fortunately, we have this very good level of cooperation and we will be proceeding forward in this regard. And now I would like to give the floor to John Brandolina, Director, Division of Tr Treaty Affairs, United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime. John, you have the floor. 
Thank you, Under Secretary General Voronkov. I'd like to thank you and uh, OCT for your leadership in making this virtual CT week happen. As clearly outlined by some of the previous speakers, COVID-19 has transformed the CT needs and priorities of member states. And UNODC, like others involved in this area, finds itself continually adapting to the environment of COVID, an environment that can be different even within individual regions or even within the same country. Our field network is proving to be an invaluable asset as it allows us to work with counterparts to assess the local and regional situations and adapt accordingly. We've adopted several measures to address both the short-term and long-term CT needs that we see evolving for member states. In the short term, for example, we scaled up the delivery of technical assistance in several languages through our online counterterrorism learning platform and trained almost 500 practitioners since the outbreak. We've also partially redirected funds to support national correctional services and CT agencies with video conferencing and protective equipment, as well as sanitation supplies. And we are releasing analysis papers on COVID and crime, like in Nigeria, we're under an EU-funded project. We uh, developed guidelines for policing during the COVID-19 emergency. Regarding the long-term CT needs of member states, we will need to support the incorporation of digital solutions into criminal justice processes. And, and, and responding to that, we're developing a new program on digitalized justice to hold terrorists accountable in the MENA region. We also need to redouble our efforts to address member states' increased vulnerability to cybercrime and attacks as use of the internet for terrorist and criminal purposes is increasing. Strengthening national institutions remains imperative still to countering terrorism, especially when these very institutions need to direct their efforts, some of their efforts, to limit the spread of the virus. And the pandemic also demonstrates how dangerous material if used by terrorist groups could be spread, including through unmanned aerial vehicles. Secretary General and his address to the Security Council in terrorist attacks. And thanks to funding from Canada and the European Union, UNODC has scaled up its efforts to combat chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear terrorism, having trained 900 practitioners from 67 countries to date. In closing, preparation, resilience, and adaptability are crucial in the face of rapidly changing conditions. And the concerted effort of the international community is more critical than ever before. It has reminded us that we must continue to work together and build back better and to not only address the virus now, but to deal with the aftermath in a post-COVID-19 environment. Thanks again for allowing us the opportunity to speak and for organizing the CT Week, and thank you for your attention. John, thank you for your contribution to the discussion. I have no new speakers in my list, so uh, I have also no questions for this very moment. So if somebody uh, from our colleagues would like to join this discussion, please don't hesitate. Uh, but I would like to make very uh, brief comment on today's discussion. So today's discussion was about multilateralism. And I think uh, it was very strong emphasis by, by all participants on this part of uh, the counterterrorism activities. Only together, only united, we could reach our aim to build up the world without terrorism. And it's very important to keep this momentum going. We need to enhance, to involve more and more factors, to use these old tools to have a really comprehensive approach to the issue. And from this perspective, human rights protection, uh, respect for human rights and counterterrorism activities, involvement of the civil society organizations, dialogue with different local communities, and so on and so forth, I think it's the, one of the main prerequisites for the final success. Of course, legislation in this regard is very important, but again, this legislation 
should be in line with all the commitments and uh, obligations with regard to the United Nations. So I think it was really very good discussion. I appreciate very much your engagement in today's uh, meeting. It's a virtual meeting, but as Jill used to say that next time it will be absolutely physical meeting and we will enjoy to contact with each other directly eye to eye. Uh, so I would like also to say that we have very good visibility. We have 9 million social media accounts to reach close to 27 million impressions for the hashtag virtual city week. 400 new followers and 20, uh, 250 5,000 impressions in Twitter in uh, a week of UNC, in, in a week. So I think it's uh, really the next emphasis that counterterrorism agenda is very global and very important for ordinary people. It's not only professionals who are reaching our site and trying to get new information about developments. It's a common people who are also taking care about their, this part of the security agenda. So again, I would like to thank all of you uh, because without your active participation, without your thoughtful interventions, I don't think it was a possibility, it is a possibility to reach so positive uh, results of today's discussion. And if you don't mind, I would like to uh, make my closing remarks and to close uh, our meeting. So, Excellencies, distinguished delegates, dear colleagues and friends, it's my great pleasure to conclude this virtual counterterrorism week, the first of its kind in the United Nations. And I can tell that it's the first of its kind in commemoration of the 75th anniversary of the United Nations. I am grateful to the eminent persons who inspired our discussions, especially United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres and European Union High Representative Joseph Borrell. My deepest thanks to all the moderators, distinguished speakers, and over 1,000 1, participants who made this week a success with their insightful contributions and recommendations. I am pleased to note that the representatives from 134 member states and over 150 representatives from international and regional organizations over 200 representatives from United Nations entities and over 80 representatives from civil society and the private sector participated in this week's events. The COVID-19 pandemic has presented the international community with one of the greatest challenges since the creation of the United Nations 75 years ago testing national resilience, international solidarity, and multilateral cooperation. While our attention is rightly focused on fighting the virus, we can't pause our efforts to prevent and counter the global threat of terrorism. As the Secretary General underscored, we need to keep up the momentum. This week is a unique opportunity to reflect together on the implications of the COVID-19 crisis on counterterrorism, member states' priorities in this context, and how the United Nations system and its partners can support them. I would like to briefly set out the key conclusions from our discussions. First, we heard in the high-level opening that a strategic investment in preparedness is needed to help build resilient societies able to cope with unpredictable environment and global challenges of the 21st century, including terrorism. COVID-19 has highlighted, and it could also exacerbate, old and new challenges 
and fault lines that terrorists are keen to exploit, including socioeconomic inequalities, weak governance, political disenfranchisement, human rights abuses, and misuse of new technologies. Second, we need to strengthen multilateralism and international cooperation at all levels in order to build back better. This requires a renewed collective commitment guided by the United Nations Charter and international law. To achieve this, we need to build on the Secretary General's call to harness the power of multilateralism. The United Nations Global Counterterrorist Strategy and relevant General Assembly and Security Council resolutions provide the normative basis for strong, holistic and collective action against the transnational scourge of terrorism. The United Nations Global Counterterrorist Coordination Compact serves as a dynamic platform to further strengthen multilateral cooperation and enhance coordination and coherence in delivery of the United Nations technical assistance to member states. I would especially like to thank the state of Qatar in this regard for its financial contribution, which made possible the development of the United Nations Global Counterterrorism Coordination Portal. Third, all events underscored the need to fully respect human rights and the rule of law in the fight against terrorism. This is integral to the whole United Nations Global Counterterrorist Strategy, not just its fourth pillar, and has been consistently reaffirmed by the Security Council. But we also heard that much is needed to translate this into practice, to move from words to concrete action, ensuring that measures to counter terrorists don't shrink civic space or hinder humanitarian activities. I want to reaffirm the commitment of the United Nations system in this regard, guided by the Secretary General's call to action for human rights. I intend, therefore, to hold a regional high-level conference on human rights and counterterrorism as soon as the current COVID-19 context allows. Fourth, our discussions emphasize the importance of en enhancing information to stay on top of a terrorism threat. This threat is ever more complex. A threat that is global but exploits local conflicts, grievances and frustrations. A threat that comes from transnational networks like ISIL and Al-Qaeda, the regional affiliates and seasoned fighters, but also from individuals and groups acting alone and from neo-Nazis, white supremacists, and new forms of racially, ethnically, politically, and ideologically motivated acts of terrorism. Fifth, participants noted that the last few months should serve as a reminder that bio and cyber terrorism could pose serious threats to international peace and security with consequences that span across borders. Pandemics magnify these threats, putting additional pressure on emergency response and security structures and increasing the risk of weaponization by non-state actors. To address these risks, multi-stakeholder collaboration and harnessing the power of technology for the good of all, of all humankind is critical. This is why the Secretary General's Roadmap for Digital Cooperation is about. Six, throughout the week, we heard that we need a whole of society approach to counter the enduring appeal of violent extremism, now fueled by hate speech and xenophobia unleashed by the pandemic. Participants particularly emphasize the need for this decisive action to prevent terrorist misuse of social media and the internet while protecting freedom of expression. These efforts mu must be underpinned by strong partnership between governments, tech companies, and civil society, and a strategic communications approach with credible voices and positive messages to counter 
terrorist narratives, civil society actors make crucial contributions to the kind of bottom-up prevention efforts that resonate with local communities. We need, to, we need a massive investment in young people, gender-sensitive and youth-driven initiatives if we want to build healthy and inclusive societies. Seventh, we discuss ongoing challenges to address the threat posed by thousands of foreign terrorist fighters. The international community must continue to prioritize international cooperation and technical assistance so that member states can detect terrorists and interdict their movement, investigate, apprehend, and bring them to justice in accordance with international law. I would like to echo the grave concerns expressed by several participants regarding women and children with suspected links to United Nations listed terrorist groups who remain stranded in Syria, Iraq, and elsewhere. COVID-19 is compounding their already dark humanitarian human rights and security situation and deterring repatriation efforts. I urge member states to take swift action regarding their nationals to meet their international obligations and to prevent this issue being used to radicalize future generations. It's very important to be fast in this regard. Eight, I would like to pay tribute to the compelling stories we heard about the plights of victims of terrorism. They are our reason of being, and we need to make sure others don't suffer the way they have. We heard how the pandemic has placed additional burdens on victims and survivors by adding to their trauma. The response to the pandemic should not stop the hard-fought progress made to uphold the rights and address the needs of victims. These discussions will feed into the first Global Congress of Victims of Terrorism that we will hold next year. Ninth, we need for a gender-sensitive approach was underlined throughout the, the need of for a gender-sensitive approach was underlined throughout the week, not just as a matter of international human rights law, but of operational effectiveness. We need to better understand how terrorists prey differently on women and men to incite and recruit the range of roles on, of women and men play in both terrorism and counterterrorism, and the differentiated impact of terrorism and counterterrorism on women and men, also in this pandemic environment. Last but not least, I was proud to launch a virtual exhibition on the work of the United Nations Counterterrorist Center, together with His Excellency Ambassador Al Malimi, the permanent representative of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia to the United Nations and chair of the Center's Advisory Board. The UNCCT Expo showcases the Center's capacity building activities, confirming its reputation as a global center of excellence. The Expo will remain open on our website for the next three weeks, and I strongly encourage everyone to visit it. I would also like to express my gratitude to all 31 donors among member states and the European Union, which are contributing to the United Nations Trust Fund for Counterterrorism and making the work of the office possible. Finally, I would like to express my words of gratitude to Microsoft for technical support of our discussions and excellent cooperation, staying connected, Dear colleagues, we are yet to fully understand the impact and consequences of COVID-19 on global peace and security. We need to remain vigilant and united. We need to anticipate the evolving threat posed by terrorists. And we need to adjust our responses to changes brought by the pandemic. Over the coming month, months, the United Nations Office of Counterterrorism will continue engaging closely with you 
in the lead up to the seventh biennial review of the United Nations Global Counterterrorist Strategy. And I look forward to seeing you again in person for the second Counterterrorism Week at the United Nations headquarters in New York next year, including the second high level conference of heads of counterterrorism agencies and the first Global Congress of Victims of Terrorism. I now declare this virtual Counterterrorism Week closed. Thank you very much for your attention. Please stay safe and sound.